there's two things I'd like to do today. I would like to quickly go through some of these things about theory. We had a really good discussion, I thought, on the use and role of theory on Tuesday. Uh, but we didn't get to talk about some of the uh, material uh, I have here. I want to quickly go through this, uh, hit the main points, hopefully. And then we're going to move on and talk about lit reviews and hands on um, have you play, uh, read some papers now, skim them, and kind of try to try to dissect how they did their lit reviews in these papers in preparation for you doing your own for next week. That's the plan. Any thoughts or questions or links? Okay, sounds good. So um, let me share this. Let me go further. So we talked about theory. We talked uh, about these two papers. Um, okay, so a couple of main points. What is a theory exactly when we say this? Well, you can think of it. A second to move this out of the way. Mouse. Better. You can think of a theory very uh, generally as a set of propositions that are logically connected, logically related assertions, if you will, um, and that express relationships about different constructs and or uh, other assertions in turn or propositions in turn. Okay, so relationships between concepts and relationships between relationships between concepts, if you will. Okay. Um, there's several characteristics of theories. They help you describe something. They help you identify constructs and phenomena and uh, define them and describe them. Um, you can make assertions about their nature. That's that's okay, you know, describing the world is, is interesting. Um, more interesting to me personally, you can make assertions about causal relationships between these. Uh, that's personally the most interesting. Um, and um, a hallmark of a great theory is not only that it articulates these causal relationships between things, but rather that it also explains the underlying causal mechanism responsible for that relationship. So the classical example that I always give um, in the 1700s, they figured out that if they feed sailors that were out at sea for a long time uh, oranges and lemons, this can cure scurvy. Um, but they had no idea why this was the case. But there was a, they established a causal relationship between these citrusy fruit and the disease. Right, so that was a good theory. You know, they had a theory about what cured the disease, but they had no idea why. Okay, they didn't know that it was vitamin C that was causing this in the first place. Um, for a while, they thought it was just uh, the fact that they're sour or tart that was that was causing the disease to uh, whatever it was curing the disease. They, they had no idea what the mechanism was. So it took almost a hundred years for other people to figure out eventually that it was vitamin C causing this. And so you can see how you, know, you can have a rock solid theory, causal theory. In fact, they, uh, they did experiments in the uh, way we think of experiments today with random assignment and whatnot uh, to establish this causal link between oranges and scurvy. But they had no idea what the mechanism was for about another hundred years long. Um, and this, uh, sorry, but this is actually even more more interesting um, because the uh, because they actually repl replaced the lemon juice with limes, which would have lower vitamin C. But then, because the trips were shorter, uh, as like the nineteen steel in, in the nineteen it was invented or in the nineteenth century, um, people wouldn't get scurvy. So so, it, it, so so the theory was at, at first they thought that it, it reinforced the theory. Oh, it's just tart. But then. Um, if I remember correctly, the thing was either lime and also like um, there was some other thing that they stored, some container they stored them in that uh, destroyed the, the vitamin C. Mm -hmm. And then, and then when they went on, I think on a, I think there was, uh, so, so, so basically the, the, the theory, there was basically like a, a wrong theory that got first confirmed and then it was also much later that, that finally the vitamin C was discovered. Right, right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Great, great addition to the story. I didn't know this. Thank you. 
Uh, I'm going to have to read more about this. If you have uh, preferences, send me. Uh, but you can see how um, this also you know, reflects the normal course of science. We can, in fact, believe things very strongly. We, you know, they had really good science to causally establish the link between these things. We could believe things very strongly for a long time, and we could all be wrong. Uh, but, you know, eventually, we find out that, I don't know, asbestos is toxic or something like that. Uh, right? but maybe for the longest time, we thought it, it's harmless to humans. Similarly with this. So um, this is why I emphasize this. I, I think you know the best possible kind of theory is one that also explains the underlying mechanism. Uh, we were talking last time about um, we talked about two kinds of generalization. Does anybody remember what we call them? Statistical and analytical. Yes. Can you remind us what the analytical one was? Um. Okay. I remember what the statistical one is. Yes, I'm gonna phone a friend. Uh, it's not like you're like you're reifying one from like one one phenomenon in terms in terms of another. Um, so you can you can you can sort of transport the results from something you know from something to, to something you don't know. That's the idea. You transport the you transfer the results from something you know to something you don't know because you know the mechanism because you understand the mechanism. That's why this works. And because it's the same mechanism, you know, in a setting where you don't know if the thing holds or not, if it's the same mechanism, then you can expect it to, because you have the theory. And because the theory talks about the mechanism. So that's the idea. This is all the hallmark of a good theory. So now, you know, when, you, when you use theory or read papers that use theory or use theory in your own work, try to get at the mechanism. You know, I often see these empirical research papers or do they have some multivariate analysis? Um, I don't know, testing hypotheses about relationship between X and Y. And they throw a million controlled variables in these regression models, uh, or they throw all possible variables at some regression model and see what sticks. Um, and I really don't like this kind of work uh, because it's sort of, you know, let's measure everything we can measure and see what sticks sort of approach. And I find it very unprincipled. I find something that starts from some, you know, established theory much more principled as a way of doing this kind of analysis. Um, so, you know, the things you throw at some multivariate regression model are not just random things that you happen to be able to measure, but they're things for which you can articulate underlying mechanisms through which they can be related to the outcome variables you care about. Okay, so that's sort of a good, that's a good analysis, a good paper. Um, okay, so that's that's important. Um, okay, right. So we keep you know believing things until they're uh, proven wrong. Um, okay, you know, you can have different flavors of theory. Uh, I like the ones that are predictive because you understand the underlying mechanism. Therefore, you're able to make predictions about cause and effect things in a new setting that you haven't like, experienced yet because you understand the mechanism. Uh, but there could be all kinds of other theories, and they could all be useful uh, in, in their respective settings. Okay. Right. Um, they also don't have to be grand. You know, we saw some examples in the papers we talked about last time about signaling theory. We saw other examples um, as well. Um, there's different levels at which these theories can operate. They don't all have to be grand. They could also be micro-level things. That still counts uh, as a theory, if you will. OK, we talked about this. OK, here's a, here's a question for you. We talked about these two maybe main and interestingly different philosophical worldviews of science. The positivists were which people? Down. Top down, they like to do experiments, they like to test hypotheses, typically drawn from some theory. That's a very common, but certainly not the only way of doing that kind of work. A common approach. The other one was the subjectivist constructivists, which is what? What does that mean? Someone else. You're uh You've been very helpful today. Well, let's let's wake everybody up. Yes. Now starting from like all the data, to just start building theories from the bottom. Mm -hmm. 
Right? So we don't yet have this theory from which we can test specific hypotheses, perhaps. We're trying to make sense of something new, something less well understood. We start from the ground up. Grounded theory is a common example of approach to building theory from, from the ground up. Okay, okay, good. Um, talked about this, hypotheses. Yes. Your previous slide links like the, um, links the objective one, like with predictivity predictivity of the theory. Mm. I was wondering why it, why it is the case where, like, yeah, why the top-down approach implies some predictivity of theory. Um, because um, a common kind of research that people do with this mindset is to test hypotheses drawn from this uh, global theory uh, in a particular context. So hypothesis is a prediction. Right? So, you, know, you expect certain things to hold in this new setting, in this new context, in, in this way, um, because you have this uh, underlying theory that explains maybe the cause and effect relationship or maybe the mechanism or something like that. So it allows you to make point predictions in settings that you haven't studied or observed yet. I see. Okay. Essentially, it's this analytical generalization mechanism that we talked about before. Right? But, but how does construction in the two business don't have this analytical uh, generalization? Because if you if you build a theory from bottom up, you're still expecting it to like hold in other circumstances. So that's right. That's right. So, but then you have to do more work for that, right? You you know the bulk of the work when you start with this mindset is articulating the theory in the first place. Um, and then you follow up and you do more work and you replicate that, you test it in different settings, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, not necessarily quantitatively. You know, you could maybe, uh, if you're doing interviews, we're gonna talk about interviews next week. If you're doing interviews, you can sample from a different population, so interviewees, and you know, redo your analysis, you know, see how the theory holds up or not in, in that new sample. So it's not about the method, quantitative versus qualitative. It's about sort of the progression of the work. Yeah. Ideally, you also expect the, um, the you know the theory to generalize beyond the setting where you first built it, uh, but that's not necessarily the point. You know, a lot of this uh, subjectivist, constructivist worldview is uh, that reality and, and knowledge is a social construct. It's not. It's not universal. It needn't hold university, but it can. It almost sounds like so. Okay, so for positives, positivists, you come up with a hypothesis and then test it. Is it the opposite for constructivists? You basically do a test and then you try to fit a theory to what you just tested. Say more. Uh, it sounds like you collect data and then you tr you try to fit it fit a theory that's compatible with your data. Okay, okay, so here's, that's, uh, here, so this, this is a good slide. Um, what you're describing, I think I would fit in this third point here, theory as an interpretive tool, perhaps. You, um, use these pre-existing theories uh, to try to fit them onto the data that you collected maybe in that particular setting. Similarly, it could be, you know, it could be number two. You're sort of um, interpreting the data you're collecting in that particular setting through this lens of some particular theory. You know, for example, we talked about signaling theory on, on Tuesday, right? Uh, your interviewees could talk about all kinds of things, but when you're reading, when you're interpreting what you learn from them, your framing is that of signaling theory. You're looking for you know, ways in which they use signal, use signals and so on, what kind of signals, how they design them, et cetera. Am I wrong to think that um, constructivism is like kind of useful up until a point? Like it seems like once the theory matures, you want to start to take a positive, positivist approach. You want to start testing theories 
or uh, hypotheses that are uh, that you deduce from your theory? Um, I think maybe maybe I would agree with this if you're talking about very grand style theories, uh, but for the kinds of phenomena that we have to deal with in engineering like work, think of, I don't know, AI tools and whatnot, all kinds of new things that come out all the time. Um, there will always be this need to understand these new things and sort of how they uh, relate or not, how they map onto old things that we understand already that we've seen before. So there'll probably always be a need to understand these new problems and new domains and new- Right, areas. certainly there'll always be a need for it because there's always new stuff. Um, I'm just thinking like once it's not new anymore and you have a, a built up theory, it sounds like it's not as useful. Yeah. But certainly it will be always be useful for something. Right. Yeah. Um, I agree with this. If we go back to day one, when we started this class, um, I tried to argue that uh, chances are you will go through this, this progression uh, more than once, you know, through the course of your careers, right? Maybe more than once through the course of your PhDs. Or you do some maybe more constructivist uh, work to understand the problem better, and then you do some, you know, deductive, objectivist work to test hypotheses and whatnot to apply solutions, uh, and probably over and over again. Cool. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. So I think they're all useful. Um, they're more useful at different phases and and stages of research. Yeah, that's it. Cool, thank you. Okay. See what else I have here. Uh, okay, very valid. All right. Um, there's really good readings. If you haven't looked at this, please go ahead and do. Um, very short and very readable. Um, the Easterbrook chapter uh, talks about a lot of what I talked about. Um, the other one, um, the uh, distinction between theory, theoretical framework, and conceptual framework. You will see these terms used a lot in research papers if you uh, pay attention to that. Uh, and often you will see them used very differently. People mean very different things. This is a great short paper that tries to articulate exactly what these things should mean and so how to use these terms uh, yourselves. Um, they're both in our shared drive folder. Um, feel free to read them. They're very interesting. Okay, so now I want to tell you a story uh, to maybe uh, make more concrete the things we talked about. So meet uh, Stu, Stu Dent. Um, Stu is a computer science graduate student, maybe uh, like uh, you all. Um, and Stu here is using AI to generate programming source code from natural language. He's trying to build some tools that do this, maybe nine months into his PhD, um, has built some tool already and is trying to evaluate the tool. Okay. So here's what Stu comes up with. Stu has, of course, taken empirical methods um, and decided that a controlled experiment well, with some ID plugin where this AI based assistant is available to programmers is a good way to evaluate uh, this tool. Um, so um, he's looking to measure a number of variables. How, um, okay, so one is the, uh, you know, the condition the participants are in. Did they use a natural language to code AI plugin or did they write code from scratch by hand? whatever that means. Okay. That's an important variable to keep track of. Um, and then number of dependent variables, things to measure as, as outcomes, how correct programs are, how quickly the participants wrote them. Um, and maybe this is a mixed methods sort of study and he's also collecting people's subjective uh, opinions of using this plugin, and how much did people like it and how usable it was and whatnot. Okay. Um, and he designs a number of uh, tasks that require programming in Python uh, to solve um, and recruits a bunch of CS grad students to participate in the experiment um, and formulates some specific hypotheses. Number one, that using code written using the AI assistant is more often correct 
than code written from scratch. Okay? Because the, uh, the AI is very smart. Number two, that people complete tasks faster when they're using the AI assistant uh, compared to when they're writing code from scratch. Um, and number three, that subjectively people prefer the code snippets generated by this AI system uh, overriding code from scratch. Sound good? Sounds related to stuff some of you are doing? Okay. Um, okay, so great, you know, Stu goes and does all of this, uh, collects all this data, analyzes it, uh, and guess what? All three hypotheses rejected. <laughs> None of them is supported by the data from the experiment. <laughs> um, as an aside, this is, oh, and furthermore, people found the thing to be unintuitive, just to make it worse. So not only did it not do what it was supposed to do, but they didn't like it either. In the um, fun fact, absolutely true story. I'm a co-author of this paper. <laughs> <laughs> so check it out. But true story. Uh, and, and very much the way I describe it. So what happened? We cried. <laughs> Say it again. We cry. We cry. Right. Oh, we cry. No, yes. We, <laughs> we for sure cried. Um, you probably don't want to hear how Frank, the first author, felt. <laughs> we cry. But what? 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 We? What happened? Why did we get here? Right. Oh, I thought you were asking what to do about it for how you cry. might have got here. Well, no result. But uh, I suppose you got here because we didn't have like theories to support the hypotheses that you're making. Mm -hmm. But he did the readings or is guessing based on the topic of our lecture? I, I suppose like a lot of people make the, the mistake of jumping into an experiment or jumping into a tool evaluation before doing previous research. Yes, if, if if I can share any personal experience from this class, this is one I can certainly share. You, know, you can read you can read all the details to yourselves um, in a lengthy write-up. Let's see what uh, what else. I agree. I agree with you. But, but let's let's dissect it more. Okay. Um, another thing is this kind these hypotheses kind of remind me of like the naive research questions that we talked about the other day. So maybe you need to start with different research questions like is NL to code correlated with, I don't know, how fast people code or how correct their code is? You could be more fundamental about it. Yes, so I, I agree with the intent here that maybe we should think more carefully. We dissected asking research questions last time uh, so that's certainly something I'm going to come back to in, in a minute. Um, I don't know if I agree with exactly the wording you suggested, but I agree with the intent here. You know, more thought maybe should be put in what we're asking in the first place. Uh, hold, hold, your, hold your thought. We're going to come back. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking about what is that <clears throat> things like all three hypotheses I rejected. So that's the finding you got. Um, does it? Uh, is that maybe it's like because of the uh, nature language code that would sell is just not good enough? Yeah, certainly. Yeah, so like, so that's a uh, like, that's a fact because the tool is not good enough. So the hypothesis I rejected, and that's a true finding. Uh -huh. And uh, there's nothing wrong with your hypothesis. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, yes. Well, what are some other reasons? Yeah. Um, that just reminds me of last class when you said that we were testing the tool more than the concepts behind it. Mm. And so that's one thing. And the other one 
maybe before doing the tool, uh, there could be some reasoning for why do we want to have it and what are the things that we want to improve? Is this writing faster just because, or do you want people to still understand what they are doing while doing faster? So there should be some more study before creating the tool. I'm, I'm with you, but in a slightly different direction. There should be more articulation of how we expect the tool to have an impact. Exactly. Exactly how, you know, and, and for whom and why uh, and you know, how much and, and, and so on. Like there should be more of that, which I haven't, I haven't done yet. Uh, here first, please. I think it's along uh, the lines that she was talking about uh, that these applied hypothesis are not so related as the mechanisms that you were talking about before. And they are too attached to, to the tool itself. Great. Um, so I think that's the uh, main problem. So we're basically done. We can call the semester over. <laughs> <laughs> got it. You got it already. No, now we want to know what to do to not do this. Also, seems like this. Maybe this is just. Maybe this is a comment that's just shot on a particular domain of this like example. Yeah. But, it seems like you could have maybe played to the strengths of using these sorts of tools more than like these like these well these hypotheses seem sort of ambitious. So it seems to me like you could maybe reformulate uh you know putting a task faster as like are people happier like after using this tool or something like there's other things that you could well this I think I think that's I think that's a distinct question from like um you know like like the like in my view the act of programming is is sort of taxing right so it's like it's like does that does that maybe take some of the burden of that off of people? Is I, I think maybe playing to the strengths of your domain is is, is also important here. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. I think we're I think we're saying the same thing. You know, we, we need more uh, fine grained reasoning here, more detailed, more precise reasoning and analysis and claims and hypotheses. Okay. Um, so. This is going to be a long list. You mentioned some, you'll find more here. Um, you know, basically, whenever we talk about any empirical research, experimental research, or observation, or otherwise, there are all kinds of threats to the validity of that research. Um, there's entire books on this. I won't talk about this now, um, but you will often find um, discussions of threats organized uh, along these different dimensions. For example, construct validity. Um, are uh, the variables, the concepts, your, are, the, are the variables you chose to measure valid measurements of the underlying constructs that you actually care about? Okay. So you know, maybe I care about correctness, you know, people solving these tasks more correctly when they're using the AI, but am I actually able to measure correctness? What does that mean? How can I measure it? But you know, theoretically, I have this concept of correctness, but do I have the right instruments to measure correctness? And the same for anything else. Do I have the right instruments to measure the thing I'm, I'm claiming I'm measuring? Okay? Because the, you know, the theory is about this concept of correctness or the concept of speed or the concept of something. The theory is not about the variable of you know, the score assigned by the student subjectively on some rubric. Or something like that, right? But the measurement is something, the concept is something else. And how well do I actually capture the concept with my measurement? So there'll be a lot of this you know, discussion of construct validity. Um, how valid was the experiment itself? For example, uh, we talk about the internal validity of the experiment here. Um, were the subjects familiar with? This assistant, you know, did they know how to use it? Or are we actually testing? Is this the comparison fair? You know, presumably they had more experience writing code in the traditional way. Did they actually know? You know, are they fluent in using this plugin enough to use it in sort of a realistic setting as part of the experiment? Or is it that you're just capturing them learning how to use the thing in the first place and not anything that has to do with improvements on productivity or whatever else? So just one example of a way in which this could be invalid just by design. So how would you mitigate this? Have some training before. 
for example. Episode of training before, yeah, that's one way. You often see sort of these warm up tasks that aren't graded, that don't count uh, as, as part of some experiment. Yeah. Um, uh, do you have a, a test for both? Uh, for, for all participants for both the traditional coding and, and for the using the tools to, to make sure that there's everyone in, in the group in, in both samples have, a, have like similar skill set. Yeah, great. Very good idea. We're going to talk about experiment design in maybe a week or so from well, not next, but the week after. Um, lots and lots on that. We're going to talk more about this. Uh, good. Okay. So a couple, couple of good ideas. Um, external validity has to do with being able to uh, take the findings from this controlled lab experiment and make claims about the, the real world. Um, so you know, were the tasks that the participants uh, completed, were they representative, were they realistic? So maybe the tasks were terrible and uh, unrealistic and not observing the differences in this unrealistic setting has nothing to do with real world uh, gains or losses in efficiency okay, induced by these tools. Uh, are the participants representative? You know, if I ask CS grad students at CMU to, to do this, um, you know, are they the right sample of participants here? Are they, and how representative are they of whoever the target audience for this tool is out in the wild? You know, maybe the CMU CS grad students are really good at writing code from scratch because they have had a lot of training. They're good programmers. Um, and you know, maybe they don't benefit as much from this AI assistant. Maybe the AI, AI assistant is much more useful to people that aren't as fluent you know, in, in that domain or with that language or that API or what have you. Okay. So you know, to what extent do we actually know what we're measuring here and what is really the claim we're making? Okay. Um, and so on, L lots of these. Um, then we can also talk about theoretical reliability. Um, here, this is, um, in our design, this is hard to escape with these kinds of biases. Obviously, uh, by design, participants knew that the tool, the AI assistant they were asked to, to uh, work with was probably built by the researcher that was running the experiment. Because the other condition was using no tool at all. I see they were asked to evaluate some new tool by probably their friend who is, uh, has an office on the same floor that they do in the same building. Because, okay. you know, easiest to recruit each other for studies and so on, right? Um, and how likely are you to tell me to my face that you hate my tool? You know, when I ask you to um, participate in my experiment, right? But maybe you don't want to hurt my feelings and, and so on and so forth, right? Lots of these kinds of things that could invalidate um, ultimately the, the claims and conclusions. So this will be, Basically, a never ending story. This semester, we're going to learn to recognize and articulate these kinds of threats. They, they are always present in, in all studies, uh, and hopefully, learn some strategies to reduce or mitigate them. That's, that's basically it. I'm sorry, like about the last point you mentioned, like subject by design, know that the tool is still on tool. Yeah. It is a a problem that can be easily dealt. Like just say like it's a somebody developed a tool when doing the interview. And then people don't know that. Possibly. 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 I don't I don't I don't know exactly how that would change the findings. I, I, I can't predict, but possibly, you know, like uh, knowing that it's your friend's tool versus removing that emotional attachment. Could change, you know, how you feel about it. Oh yeah, but I'm just saying, like then, uh, there's no more such kind of threats, I guess. This particular one, less so in in this instance, but there'll be lots of other ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yes, agreed. Um, okay. Um, so, yeah, 
what went wrong? Well, you know, what was the research question? That the AI assistant, whether the AI assistant is better or not than writing code from scratch. You know, is tool A better than tool B, roughly, tracking a bit. So, no, not a great research question as we have discussed last time. Um, what would count as an answer? You know, yes, if you say yes. Right? Is tool A better than tool B? Yes, the end. You know, if you if you read that paper and, and that's the question, and they you know, do an experiment and they show you, they tell you yes, uh, the paper ends. Not very satisfying, right? So we talked, uh, you know, a week ago about all kinds of ways to make the question itself more interesting and more precise. You have a comment? Uh, so the issue here is not really that the hypothesis failed, right? It's that it's that um, it's that the, it's that the approach that was taken to create the hypotheses or, or and, and to create the, the sort of study design was wrong, but the, the hypotheses themselves failing is not really that that much of an issue. I, I'm going to come back to this in a second. I know. I'm going to argue that the hypotheses themselves also uh, should be refined. Sure. Okay. But basically, how did you arrive at them? Uh, result in this case because there wasn't maybe I, I didn't articulate a very principled approach to arrive at the hypothesis in the first place I just articulated some hypotheses sure so okay. um, once I do that once I do the first part um, you will see how maybe we would arrive at slightly different more precise hypotheses. okay um, okay so you no know, if you think about it right this kind of question, drug A better than drug B, which is what we're basically asking here, it's not two A better than two B. This kind of question is rarely what gets asked in medical research. Actually, what gets asked is a lot more nuanced and a lot richer and more interesting. Um, why do we need to know? What, what do we really care about? Is it really about the drugs or is it about something else? Um, why would we expect it to be better? What's the underlying mechanism? What would we do with the answer? You know, does it matter? Like, what's the intervention afterwards? Is it policy or something else? Uh, better how and when and, and for whom? And what exactly? Who's the audience? And, and how would that work? Better in what way? Better at doing exactly what? You know, better is sort of this very vague concept. There could be lots of ways in which it's better. It could be some in which it's worse. What does it ex exactly mean uh, here? Uh, and so on. So your questions that are much more nuanced. Uh, hey, uh, I think I've convinced you that this applies to you. I think I've convinced you that, you know, we need to have this underlying theory before we go and, and do these evaluations and experiments. Um, let's see what Stu's theory could have been. So first off, you know, Stu here starts with some background assumptions. For example, that tasks can be completed by piecing together these code snippets that involve, I don't know, popular libraries and APIs and whatnot. And that's a background assumption. You sort of have to assume that, otherwise this doesn't make sense even earlier on. So that's reasonable, arguably. Um, also, you know, Stu assumes here that lots of these examples such examples exist in the data that was available to train the AI in the first place. Therefore, the AI is likely to be able to handle these kinds of situations. And so, you know, you were mentioning earlier that you know, how good is the AI in the first place? Does it do anything seemingly useful uh, or not? But, you know, there could be lots of these background assumptions um, that you have to make. It's often also very good to articulate them, to make them explicit in the paper. You know, you could say, we assume this and this and that. And whether these things are not true is beyond the scope of this work. You know, go and test them and whatnot and prove me wrong. But we assume these things are true and hold. Uh, and we're going to focus on this other part as part of this study. So here's uh, here's you know one possible theory that Stu had. Uh, programmers decompose tasks into a sequence of maybe small steps, and at every step. They know conceptually what to do next, but they either don't know how to create a concrete implementation of that abstraction, um, or they would they do know how to create it, but they would rather not type it in because who wants to type more when they can type less? 
Okay. Um, so the AI assistant could speed up task completion, but probably more so in the second scenario. Okay. The second scenario is the one where you know what needs to happen and you know how to do it, but you know it saves you clicks and, and keystrokes. You just don't want to type all that in. Because in the other scenario, you probably have to spend a lot of time thinking about what the AI tells you the solution is as well. You have to figure out if what the AI tells you makes sense, if it's correct, it's, you know, all kinds of reasoning that has to happen and time you have to spend and work you have to do, right, to use that. Uh, but because otherwise you might not recognize which of these results to use. You know, you, if, if there's multiple suggestions, you won't know which one to pick unless you understand what's going on. If there's one suggestion, you won't know if it's right or wrong. You know, if it's wrong, you won't know why it's wrong. Okay. So possible speed ups would occur primarily because uh, this one mechanism, uh, users may get distracted when they switch context going outside of their IDEs, maybe not because of the time it would take to write down the source code, because maybe actually you don't write it down from scratch anyway. You go search the web and you copy it from Stack Overflow or somewhere else. So really maybe this whole setting of programming from scratch is, is unrealistic to begin with. But the actual comparison would be, you know, against copy pasting stuff from the web or something like that, versus getting it from the AI system. Okay, because people rarely write stuff from scratch. They mostly just copy stuff from the web. Um, and, and so on and so forth. You, know, you can see, you can see how you can go on. You can see other ways in which you can articulate this theory. The point is just to do this at all in the first place, okay? even if you go in a slightly different direction. So then the hypotheses are also slightly different here. Okay. So here are some ways um, the hypothesis could go. Four tasks where programmers have extensive prior knowledge, meaning they can make sense of the suggestions of the AI, um, and they could have written that code from scratch if they wanted to. Using the assistant should reduce task completion times okay, because it saves them keystrokes. You don't have to do it. And, and they can quickly recognize that the solution is correct and move on with the rest of the task. Um, and more so, the more steps, meaning the more of these things you have to piece together to arrive at a complete solution for the task, the more steps are involved in this, um, the more the assistant should speed up task completion. Okay? Because you know, the more of these things, it saves you from typing. Okay? So you should see more of a speed up on more complex tasks that require you know, breaking down into more Substeps, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. You can see how you can keep going with much more specific, much more precise hypotheses here that are all drawn directly from this theory about what really is uh, the mechanism behind how these things would impact programmers. Okay. So what I'd like you to do, you know, next time your advisor asks you to evaluate some, some tool you've built or, or similar is, is to do all this work before you design a study to, to do that. Because this will save you, I promise, a lot. Yes, it will be a little bit of work extra, but it will save you so much frustration later on when everything comes back negative or statistically insignificantly different. <laughs> okay. So it will cost you a couple of you know days or weeks early rather than six months of work later. Okay. So just trust me on this. I've been through it more than once. <laughs> okay. And uh, I'm going to stop here with theory. Any questions? Uh this would be like a positivistic approach. It would be. Yeah. That was basically. If yeah. you wanted to do something more constructivist, this wouldn't be the kind of thing that you would do before a study. Great. What would you do? What would you do if you wanted to be a social constructivist? Yeah. Maybe you study people as they use an L to go. Hmm. You build a tool, you release it on the VS Code marketplace for plugins or whatever. It's instrumented, 
something, or you just observe people using it in the wild and you figure out what it is they're doing with it, how they're using it, what they're doing with it. Maybe you use the telemetry data, maybe you observe them, maybe you uh, walk people behind them as they're going to class and you observe them using it or something. You know, whatever it may be, right? You, st you start from the ground up. You start from people using the thing and try to make sense of what they're doing. And, and then you build some theory and then you go test hypothesis from that if you need to do something or as a follow. That makes sense? Okay, very good, all right. So we'll stop here with theory, move on to lit reviews, see how far we go with this. Um, okay. So, um, okay, um, we have readings there in the shared folder. This first paper here that talks about the problem gap book heuristic, three components, problem gap book, we're gonna practice this in a minute. This is an amazing two-pager or something paper, amazingly well-written and to the point that teaches you essentially everything you ever need to know about how to do it. All you have to do is read, read this two-pager. It's great. I so highly recommend that you go do this. Um, I'll tell you what this is, but yeah, please, go, please go do this. Uh, and then there's a couple of um, readings for more, uh, more information. Um, Okay, so why do a lit review at all? Um, you may ask this. One reason, maybe the main reason, is because it helps you distinguish between problems or studies or projects, uh, things that can be studied and versus things that perhaps should be studied with some priority. You know, lots of us find, we all find some things more interesting intrinsically than others, you know, and might gravitate towards them just because we like doing that kind of work or because we like the domain. Okay. Uh, but it doesn't mean these are the most important problems to work on. So often you see, um, if you look at the criteria for research papers, in computer science, the re review criteria, the criteria that program committee members are asked to review papers on and make decisions about papers on, often include something like significance or importance. It's not only, you know, is the study novel and is it sound and this and this and this other thing is the paper written, but is the problem something that anyone cares about other than the authors? Um, and you know, a lit review is a good way to gain some confidence that the problem is at all important, that other people care about it, you know, who these people are, what impact they're solving it might have on the world uh, around you. Okay. Um, okay, multiple reasons to do a lit review, just to report what is known about a topic. Um, but most importantly, to identify what is unknown. This is why we do a lit review. We do a lit review to summarize what we know, but more so to summarize and articulate what we don't yet know. If, for example, I uh, am asking you for homework, do a lit review on these kinds of biases, uh, different kinds of biases in student evaluations of teachers. There's a lot, there's a lot of work on this. Lots of papers, you'll find them very quickly as you start reading. Uh, but what I'd like you to also, you know, focus on and, and put some thought in is what we don't know about this phenomenon, and especially, you know, how the CMU environment might be different from what was reported in the literature, uh, which might suggest reasons, sorry, might suggest that some of these prior findings may not transfer over you know, to, to the CMU environment for reasons that you will hopefully articulate. Okay, so articulating what remains unknown is a key part of, of this. Um, okay, several forms of interview. Okay, uh, certificate contributions. Okay, let's do something hands-on. Let's read the first one. Let's read short and sweet. Read only the first two and a half pages. 
And when I say read, I mean skim. So five minutes. Okay, prompts are, how much prior work was there about the particular phenomenon or question they're asking? How is the lit review structured? We're gonna dissect literally how they wrote this down, how they articulated their argument. Um, and questions, maybe a little bit, what are they asking, but also what's the gap? What is it that, what's new? What are they doing that's new? What's the gap in knowledge that this study is contributing to? Think about these things as you're reading the first two and a half, skimming the first two and a half pages. 